Happy Halloween. Welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Mass. Um, it's great to see such a big crowd. I think we all know why we're here, because this office is such a huge supporter of neuroscience. I'm sure I am not the only person who subscribes to alerts on Google Scholar. Um, Tim Bristeinen, uh, faculty at Carnegie Mellon today. This is just a small sample of his papers. His co-author, Bradley Wojtek of UC San Diego. Similarly, these are giants in the field. They're also pioneers in the field of zombie research. And um, there's not a lot more to say. Um, I know their parents are exceptionally proud of them. I know we're eager to hear what Tim has to say about developments in this emerging field that he is helping to blaze a path in. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the author of this seminal and groundbreaking book, Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? A Neuroscientific View of the Zombie Brain, Tim Verstein. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and happy Halloween, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, uh, before I, I get into it, I just would like to point out that uh, my collaborator, Bradley Wojtek, and I have kind of teamed up on this. And what you're going to see is a hobby that's gone out of hand. Um, it just, it's, it, we're, we're, we're both zombie geeks, and how this started was that uh, in graduate school, we were both in the same program, and uh, on our off hours, we like to just geek out and watch zombie movies. And uh, being nerds, we decided, well, what would happen with the zombie brain? And it all went downhill from there. So you're about to see the aftermath of that. Um, but before I really get into the nitty gritty details, just a disclaimer, I'm gonna be showing uh, clips from uh, some zombie movies, primarily Night of the Living Dead, because it's the best zombie movie ever. Uh, there's, so there's gonna be a little bit of 1960s style gore and uh, some spoilers, so just be warned. Um, all right, so I get asked this question a lot by my colleagues in neuroscience. Why zombie neuroscience? Why, why are we doing this silly endeavor on our off hours instead of writing another grant? Uh, well, Brad and I are both big science outreach advocates. And one of the things we're interested in is trying to get general audiences more engaged with basic science information. Uh, by and large, the way the broader public gets science is filtered through uh, uh, types of media sources that try to spin it, and make big uh, you know, mountains out of small molehills, um, and often it gets distorted. So I think uh, we need to get the general public more engaged in the real core scientific literature. Uh, so we've thought about possibilities of doing this. One, we thought about using internet memes as our figures to illustrate our findings. Um, so, you know, use your LLL cat to display heavy in networks. That didn't go over so well. Uh, we pondered accidentally releasing sex tapes during our lectures to get a broader audience coming in. Uh, our lawyers suggested that we don't do that. Uh, and we thought, well, maybe we could attract more readers to our journal articles if we just added a Kardashian to the author list. Uh, Again, apparently you need their permission in order to put them on the author list, so this didn't work. And each one of these approaches uh, has the following structure. What we're doing is we're trying to take aspects of popular culture and inject it into science and kind of pull people into the basic science. Um, and it's kind of hard to do. So I think what we need to do is instead flip this and say, bring science into popular culture. How can we start bringing real scientific principles into popular culture in order to educate the broader public on scientific issues? And so this was our first attempt at this kind of leveraging of science information into popular culture. Um, and so, of course, us being zombie nerds, well, we're going to take a look at zombies first. They're actually a perfect example for uh, exploring neuroscientific ideas in this broader context. So that's why zombie neuroscience. Uh, so for the next about half an hour or so, bear with me. We're going to be uh, suspending our disbelief and pretending that outside around Kendall Square, the undead are walking around. In fact, on a Halloween like today, there probably are undead walking around Kendall Square. So uh, welcome to the science of the surviving the zombie apocalypse, more importantly, the neuroscience of it. So as a scientist, and as a neuroscientist in particular, when I see a zombie like this woman here, I see an undead creature, yes, but I also see a spectrum of very particular types of behaviors that you see repeated again and again and again in The Walking Dead. 
you see things like hyperaggression, memory deficits, attention problems. You'll see language disruption, reduced impulse control, movement disorders, and even visual recognition impairments. And these are seen across almost every genre of the zombie movie. Um, so as a neuroscientist, this tells us something very interesting. This gives us some pretty key insights into what's happened to this individual's brain as she's gone from being a high school cheerleader into being a ravenous zombie. So using this uh, collective set of behaviors that have changed in the zombie, we were able to actually reconstruct a model of what the zombie brain looks like. Let me show you our model here. So on the left right here is a normal, neurologically healthy human individual. There's lots of tissue packed into a really small space, so it's very wrinkly. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very robust, healthy looking structure. On the right is the zombie brain. And what you see is lots of big gaps, lots of space that's unused. In fact, this little guy back here is completely gone in the zombie brain. We're going to get to that a little bit later. So this shows atrophy in the zombie brain. And this atrophy that you're seeing isn't random. Each one of the areas that's decayed away in the zombie brain reflects a very particular symptom that we see in zombieism. So the goal of Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep is to take apart the behavior of zombies and link it back up to each one of these brain regions that's been atrophied and destroyed in the zombie brain. So that's what we're going to do today, and just looking at a few of these symptoms. Now, before we do, we're scientists. We like to take what seems like supernatural phenomenon and make it dry and boring and clinically defined. So we're going to define zombieism not as zombies, but as a clinical disorder. And so we're going to call it Consciousness Deficit Hypoactivity Disorder, CDHD, which is defined as the loss of rational, voluntary, and conscious behavior that's been replaced by delusional impulsive aggression, stimulus-driven attention, and the inability to coordinate motor or linguistic behaviors. There, we've stripped away all the really weird supernatural stuff and made it a nice, clean, studyable phenomenon. Also, with a cool name like CDHD, maybe we can get a pharmaceutical company to uh, fund our research. All right, so from now on, we're going to be calling zombieism CDHD. And we're going to try to explore the neural underpinnings of CDHD by going through a set of symptoms that we see with the disorder. So the first symptom or the first behavioral characteristic that people notice when they encounter the undead is their hyperaggression. Let's see an example of this behavior. This is Karen. Karen's just recently turned to the undead. Um, and here she's, I believe, eating the arm of her father. And let's see what happens when Karen runs into her mother. because you always got to get the garden shoes. OK, we'll save you the uh, blood and gore there. But I think it's pretty safe to say that Karen's pretty angry with her mother, right? And the most normal kids who are not angry with their parents don't grab a garden shear and start stabbing them. Uh, so this type of aggression is interesting because it's very reflective of a well-described type of anger known as Reactive impulsive aggression. This is a subtype of aggression, and this is a quote from an actual scientific paper, a subtype of aggression that can result in sudden, heightened, enduring, or inappropriate aggressive responses. So this is the stimulus-driven type of aggression that you'll see when you engage the body's fight or flight responses. And it's very different than the type of aggression you see in, say, something like a school shooting, which is a very calculated, decisive, cool type of aggression. And we know a lot about the neural underpinnings of this reactive impulsive aggression, what we sometimes call this road rage aggression. Um, so this type of aggressive behavior is well characterized in many animal models. So we've laid out a lot of the neural circuits that drive this type of response. So let's take a look at those neural circuits. The control of aggression normally, in hopefully everyone in this room, uh, is regulated by areas in the front of the brain in the prefrontal cortex, uh, usually around what's known as the orbital frontal co cortex or complex. And this is a set of uh, higher level brain areas that regulate a lot of different things. But one of the things they do is they regulate control of subcortical networks, networks that are buried deep in the brain. 
And in particular, one area known as the amygdala receives extensive input from this orbital frontal complex. And what this does is it acts as like a cooling mechanism for amygdala function. So the orbital frontal cortex is doing the shh, it's OK. It's OK. And the amygdala is hypersensitive to potential threats in the environment. It's always looking for a threat. So if we wanted to couch this in Freudian terms, and please, I hope my department chair doesn't hear me talking about Freud in this talk, um, you can think of the amygdala as being the id and the orbital frontal cortex as being the superego. It's trying to keep this reactive, uh, primal, instinctive fight or flight response intact. So the amygdala controls aggression through a very particular uh, set of interactions between areas known as the hypothalamus and the thalamus, which in turn send uh, excitatory projections to an area of the brain known as the periaqueductal gray. This is buried deep, deep in the brain. And the periaqueductal gray stimulates your arousal mechanisms. So it's what gets you ramped up, and in this case, aggressive. So normally, the prefrontal cortex is saying, calm down, don't react, that guy cut you off in traffic, don't throw a brick through his window. But if you remove the orbital frontal cortex from the equation, what happens is these subcortical fight or flight responses are unchecked. So you get an unconstrained amygdala response, which through this network of other areas, increases sensitivity to reactive behaviors. And what you get if you wipe out those prefrontal control mechanisms is you get a unconstrained uh, impulsive rage, you get uh, more appetite dysregulation, chronic stress responses, you'll even get appetite dysregulation. So these are all behaviors that you see in animals with damage to the orbital frontal areas, and you also see it in zombies. So I think it's a pretty good guess that that's what we're seeing, at least in this case, with zombies. So if we look at the human brain and the zombie brain side by side, the orbital frontal areas that tend to control this type of reactive response rest right up here. This is the front side of the brain, looking at front, and this is an underview of the brain here. If we look in the zombie brain, we see an atrophy of these prefrontal networks. So that control region is, is gone away. But that's not all. It just doesn't, you don't just see extensive damage to the zombie brain. We actually see some plasticity as well. So if we look at those subcortical areas, like the amygdala and the thalamus, so this is a slice through the brain right about here on the left, showing the amygdala in red. And this guy on the right, this is a slice through the brain this way, showing the thalamus. And if we look at the volume of these two subcortical areas, the humans are displayed in gray, and zombies are displayed in orange. And we see, actually, the, these areas should be bigger. These areas are more enlarged in, these, uh, in the zombie or the CDHD subtypes than what you see in humans. So they're unconstrained. They're using more resources, and they're building more neurons. So they're becoming more sensitive. So this explains a little bit how you have this reactive aggression in the zombie brain. So let's look at another symptom of the, uh, the zombie epidemic or the CDHD epidemic. Let's look at visual recognition. I'm going to show you two scenes of the same two individuals. The first is a scene before this gentleman here, Johnny, has turned. And this is his sister, Barbara. So really be scared. Johnny. You're still afraid. Stop it now. I mean it. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it. OK, so it's very obvious he knows who this person is, right? Now let's look at Johnny after he's become a zombie. So notice he doesn't have that glint of recognition in his eye. He doesn't see his sister. He just sees a human that he can devour, right? He doesn't recognize her at all. And this seems to be a, a, a common phenomenon throughout the zombie genre, right? You see many times two high school sweethearts. One gets bitten and turns into a zombie. As soon as they turn to the zombie, they start to eat the cheek of their loved one because they no longer recognize them. They just react as if this is just some random person that they can devour. Uh, and this type of visual recognition problem uh, resembles a well-described psychiatric disorder known as Capgras delusion. Capgras delusion is the false belief that the people you know well have been replaced by imposters and are typically seen of as a threat. Um, this is kind of the invasion of the body snatchers psychiatric disorder. It's a very real disorder. Um, so you, know, you wake up one morning, and suddenly that's not your wife laying next to you. That's some alien that's inhabited your wife's body. 
She might look, sound, talk like my wife, but she's not really my wife. Um, this isn't always bad. There was a case report of a woman who was in a miserable marriage for years. Uh, she, I think, had a stroke, developed Capgras solution, and was convinced that her husband was replaced by Casanova, and that she was having an illicit affair with this Casanova that was in her husband's body, and their love life actually improved. So it's not always bad. Um, but Capgras delusion is a psychiatric problem, uh, which means it's characterized at this kind of behavioral level, but we don't really know the neural underpinnings of it. But the phenomenon is very similar to a well-described neurological phenomenon known as prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is the inability to link a person's identity to the visual image of their face. So in the classic uh, scenario, somebody with prosopagnosia, you stand them in front of a mirror and say, who's looking back at you? and they won't be able to tell you who they are. They'll just say, I see a face, I see that person, they've got a beard, um, but I don't know who they are. Or um, another famous example is an experimenter will be showing a set of faces on the screen, the experimenter's face will come on the screen, the experimenter's right here, and the guy asks, who are you seeing on the screen? And the patient will reply, I don't know, somebody. So uh, this type of disorder has been described in the neurological literature for about 100, and, oh, about 100 years or so now. Um, and it's linked to disorders or damage to a particular network of areas in the brain known as the face network. OK, so the face network, particularly an area known as the fusiform face area, are a well-described set of brain areas that are sensitive to seeing faces more than any other object. In fact. Uh, the face area was first described at MIT by Nancy Canwisher about 20 years ago. So the way the face network is characterized is, let's say I put you in an MRI scanner and look at the functional activation of your brain when I show you pictures. So I show you a picture of this dude here, and then I show you pictures of houses or cars, and I say, which areas are more active to this face than to these cars? Well, what you would see is a set of regions in the back of the head on the underside of the neocortex. So each one of these blobs here shows a separate region that's more responsive to this face than anything else. This is sometimes known as the core face network. And what these are is a set of well-connected brain regions that basically deconstruct the visual image of a face, reassemble it, and link it categorically to an individual. So it's a stream of information starting in the back where the primary visual cortex is that just sees spatial features and keeps moving forward to higher level areas of the brain until it's linked up to a face. So damage to any part of this network can lead to prosopagnosia. And I'm going to show you an interesting example of temporarily induced prosopagnosia. What we're going to see is a uh, patient who's about ready to undergo neurosurgery. He's got a tumor in the underside of his brain near that core face network. And surgeons want to resect the tumor, but they don't want to make him prosopagnosic. So what they did is they implanted stimulators on the underside of his brain. And what they're going to do is they're going to stimulate different parts and see where does his face perception get disrupted. And that way they can map out where those face selective areas are, and the neurosurgeon can kind of work around them. So you're going to see two trials here. In one trial, the experimenter isn't going to deliver any stimulation at all. In the second trial, they're actually going to deliver stimulation. Uh, so this took place in Stanford, and this patient is, has no neuroscience or psychology background whatsoever. So he doesn't know what's going on. When I do this, all right? One, two, three. Nothing. Nothing? OK. I'm going to do it one more time. Look at my face. One, two, three. You just turned into somebody else. Tell me Your face it. metamorphosed. Your nose got saggy, went to the left. You almost looked like somebody I'd seen before, but somebody different. That was a trip. I love that last line. So just a brief stimulation of these face areas. In this particular case, it was the fusiform face area caused this disruption of the perception of the face. And so as the clip goes on, I don't have time to show you the entire clip, the experimenter keeps turning down the voltage and keeps turning down the current. And eventually he says, your face didn't change. I just didn't know you were you. So the disconnect between seeing the face and the identity of the experimenter, he was looking at the experimenter. He knew who this person was, just got disconnected. 
So this is a great example of a transiently induced prosopagnosia. Um, the, the, the whole image of the face just got torn apart. So the face network is part of a larger visual network in the brain known as the ventral visual stream. And so this is the ventral visual stream in one of our zombie uh, experimental subjects. So this is the primary visual cortex here. And information that flows on the underside of the brain, mostly along the temporal lobe, and this is the undercurrent here, is part of the ventral visual stream. So this is the fusiform face area I talked about earlier. This is known classically as the what pathway. It's the pathway in your brain that tries to assemble object knowledge and recognize objects in the world. So if we look at this what pathway in a human, if we did a slice right through the brain, this would be like a sagittal slice right through here. This is the main core of the what pathway on the left and right side. In the zombie brain, the what pathway would be extensively damaged. So they would have impaired face knowledge, object knowledge. Um, and this is actually where the fusiform face area sits in the right hemisphere. So we're going to say that not only are zombies losing the uh, prefrontal control of their aggression, they're also lost the ability to recognize faces and other objects, with few exceptions. OK. Another classic deficit we see in CDHD all the time is language. Zombies don't talk. In fact, I'm going to show you an example of the most fluent zombie we know of if you ignore that movie, Warm Bodies. OK, that's Tar Man. Tar Man is the individual who single-handedly linked brains to zombies. Up until Tar Man, brains and zombies weren't linked. Zombies would eat any part of the body. They'd go for the liver before they'd go for the brain. But Tar Man had a particular a taste for brains. And so he was the one who was always going after brains. But I want you to notice something. Here he was asking this uh, teenager if he could eat her brains. But he didn't say, can you come over here so that I can eat your brains? Or please come by because your gray matter looks delicious. No, he just said brains, right? You got the idea, but it was a single word sentence. That type of uh, phenomenon, if we see it in clinical neurological patients, is known as telegraphia. So the idea being that patients who are having difficulty getting words out will resort to just the most critical parts of the sentence, the most critical semantic parts of the sentence, and take away all the other fluency. And the name comes from the old telegraph for you know, long distance communication 100 and some years ago. Uh, in that case, you paid by the character, right? So you had to make your notes short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, the same is true with these patients. They have trouble getting out words, so the whole idea is just to get out the key, most important parts of the sentence. Now, telegraphy is a symptom that you see in a larger class of disorders known as aphasias. And aphasias are a, are a, a broad term that reflect really any language deficit, but there's many subtypes. So for example, there's the inability to produce language, which is classically known as Broca's aphasia, or difficulty comprehending language, which is classically known as Wernicke's language, or Wernicke's aphasia. And each one of these two areas has different cortical sources, but that play a larger part in the language networks of the brain. So this is Tar Man here holding his favorite dish. So this is the human brain right here. We're looking on the left side. So Broca's area is right up here in front. And this is the area that, if you damage it, gets you Broca's aphasia. Um, it's tightly linked up to the motor cortex. And it's single-handedly linked to the language production end of things. So it's what forms your mouth movements and your gestural patterns to producing language. In the back, right in the temporal lobe, or right by the temporal lobe and the parietal where they meet, you see Wernicke's area, which is a region that's linked to language comprehension. So if you damage Wernicke's area, you can get words out. They're just discombobulated. They're not well structured. You also have difficulty understanding people. And these two areas are connected together by a very large bundle of white matter pathways known as the arcuate fasciculus. These are big, super highways of the brain that connect Wernicke's and Broca's area. And you think about it as language, what you're doing is you're constructing the idea and semantics of what you're saying. You're shipping all that information out to the output area of, of the language circuit and saying, ship out this information to the rest of the world. So information typically flows from Wernicke's over to Broca's. And damage to any one of these areas will impair language function. So 
If we look at this circuit in the human and zombie brain, this is the human on the left, Broca's would be right about up here, and Wernicke's right about back here. If we look in the zombie brain, we see extensive atrophy in both ends of the circuit. Right? So basically, this tells us don't try talking to a zombie. They're not going to understand you, and they're not really going to talk back except for maybe asking for your brains. So uh, this could explain how you get these sorts of language fluency problems in the CDHD disorder. Okay, the final symptom I'm going to go over for CDHD is movement. And this is this is what really, when you ask somebody to pretend to be a zombie, the first thing they do is move and walk like a zombie. So let's see a, a classic zombie movement here. I want you to pay attention to how these creatures are walking. All right, so we have arms out, wide, lumbering, stiff stance. They tend to do this, right? Um, so there's obviously something wrong with the way their brains are coordinating their actions. So let's take a quick look at the, circ the general circuits in the brain that regulate our movements. There are three big collective circuits in the brain that drive our actions. There's actually many more than this. These are just the, the big sets of them. In the neocortex, you have the cortical motor areas. So this is our zombie subject here. This is their brain. Everything shown here in gray are cortical motor areas. And this is actually a collection of a few dozen different areas that collectively coordinate your actions. And they're responsible for things like sensory integration, movement planning, and movement execution. So they kind of plan what to do with the marionette strings of your muscles and joints and coordinate those movements together. Underneath the motor cortex and deep in the brain is an area known as the basal ganglia. This is the second major motor pathway. So this little alien looking creature in here, and that's, that's uh, a deep cortical nuclei, a subcortical nuclei. Uh, and part of the basal ganglia circuit. And what they do is they're responsible for gating or inhibiting actions. So really, they're the gatekeepers of the movements that you execute. So they decide whether or not you're actually going to throw a brick through a window or not. So they kind of make that final output decision. And then on the back of the head here, this is shown right back here, is a little cauliflower-shaped uh, uh, area of the brain known as the cerebellum. Cerebellum is uh, responsible for motor timing and actual temporal perception, too, coordination and error correction. So it's the kind of quality assessment guy that makes sure that your actions are being conducted smoothly and, and, and uh, without major errors. So each one of these three areas contributes in different ways to different types of motor control. Now, when most people look at the way that zombies move, the first thing they'll say is, oh, they look like they have Parkinson's. In fact, uh, Slate just had a write-up of one of our chapters from the book yesterday, and their first title um, before we got them to change it was, Do Zombies Have Parkinson's? Um, and Parkinson's is a disorder of the basal ganglia. So uh, patients with Parkinson's lose a major pathway in this system, and it results in a very particular type of movement disorders. But let me show you what Parkinson's patients look like when they have full-blown movement disorders. So typically, they'll have slouched posture, they're losing postural control. Their hands are closer to their sides, and the way they walk are short, shuffling steps. This is a very characteristic Parkinson's walk. That's not what we see in the CDHD disorder at all, right? We see wide legs, stiff arms out as a balance problems in these kind of lumbering walks. That kind of movement actually resembles a different motor disorder known as spinal cerebellar ataxia. So individuals with SCA, or spinal cerebellar ataxia, suffer from an inability to produce smooth, coordinated actions, and it results in these kind of lumbering movements, balance problems, tremors, slurred speech, visual eye movement problems. It's a host of different movement problems. And they all resolve around the fact that uh, patients with this disorder are suffering from a degeneration of the cerebellum itself. So the cerebellum atrophies away, and it causes these movement disorders. In fact, if you want to know just very little bit what it's like to suffer from this disorder, think about the last time you were drunk. You had balance problems, your slurred speech, your kind of stumbled walk. Those are all cerebellar symptoms because the alcohol is explicitly influencing and affecting the cerebellum. So that's what these individuals suffer on a daily basis without the euphoria of alcohol. Um, so those kind of movements are very, very characteristic of cerebellar damage. 
Now, the cerebellum is probably my favorite area of the brain. It's a, a, kind of underappreciated in the neuroscientific community. Um, it contains half of the neurons in the brain. Uh, so even though the neocortex is bigger, the cerebellum contains half of the neurons. And it had a sordid history. There were a ton of really off-the-wall theories about what the cerebellum did. Early on, it was thought to just regulate the fluids of the body. Um, there was uh, once a theory that it was the battery of the brain, so it was just doing voltaic uh, 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 battery generation in order to produce electrical impulses. But perhaps my favorite early theory of the cerebellum came from the phrenologists. The phrenologists were the early uh, neuroscientists who tried to map out lumps on the head with certain personality characteristics. And the phrenologists thought that the cerebellum was the root of the libido. Okay. They thought that all your sexual drive came from the cerebellum. And they were scientists. I like to knock the, the phrenologists, but they, they practiced the scientific method. And they figured this out because they would go to French prisons and then feel bumps on the heads of different criminals. And they just noticed that criminals with chronic habitual masturbation problems had larger bumps over the back of their head by where the cerebellum was. So they thought, ah, they've got large cerebellum, so that's what's driving these sexual impulses. And to their credit, they'd actually tried an experimental manipulation to see if they could prove this theory. So in one individual, this poor female inmate, they strapped an ice cube to the back of her head. Strapped it in, tied it in, a giant block of ice, and noticed that this inmate stopped touching herself when the ice cube was strapped to the back of her head. So voila, they proved that the cerebellum is responsible for the libido. Um, so if you're like me, you could probably see many different reasons why people would stop touching themselves with a giant block of ice to the back of their head. And uh, another individual who kind of shared this theory was this gentleman here, Pierre Florenz. Pierre Florenz is a classic neuroanatomist and neurophysiologist um, who was really a pioneer of early neurology. And he thought this was ridiculous. So I'm going to read you a quote from a, an article about his discovery of how the cerebellum is actually linked to motor control. Florenz dismissed as unfounded the claims for the sexual function of the cerebellum. He removed the cerebellum of a mature rooster. The animal was still deeply interested in the hens, but motor dysfunction made it difficult for him to express his feelings towards them. I love that little delicate ending there. Um, so basically, the, the rooster was still randy, but he couldn't really coordinate his actions to make his affections known. So this was actually the first explicit case showing that the cerebellum was linked to motor control. And it didn't happen until the mid-1800s. So since then, we've done a lot of work characterizing how the cerebellum is linked to motor control. Now, cerebellum sits right back here in the humans. And over here in the zombie brain, you see that the cerebellum is pretty much completely atrophied. So, these kinds of movement disorders that you see in zombies reflect severe cerebellar dysfunction. Now, uh, any zombie movie, move me, sorry, any zombie movie fan in the audience is going to uh, uh, be a little bit frustrated at this point because so far I've only been talking about one very particular subtype of the CDHD disorder, known as the slow zombie subtype. Right? These are the classic early forms of the disease as we saw it. But more recently, another subtype has emerged, particularly starting around 2002, 2004. And that's the fast zombie subtype, right? These guys don't lumber. They don't have discoordinated actions. They can climb. Um, they can, uh, if you've watched the movie World War Z, they can swarm. Um, and these are vicious, vicious predators out there. So uh, we wanted to say, OK, well, uh, what? This is the difference between this guy and this guy. So uh, uh, Brad and I kind of flew out to England, uh, grabbed ourselves a set of uh, fast zombies, brought them back to the lab, and looked at their brains. And if you compare the brains of the slow zombie to the fast zombie, you see some very interesting things. First off, you see that the fast zombie has an intact cerebellum. So they still have this motor coordination ability intact. They also have no atrophy in the superior parietal portions of the brain. These are the brain portions up here, which means they have actually better spatial attention as well. So there's not as extensive brain damage in the fast zombie as what you see in the slow zombie variant of the CDHD disorder. So what drives this difference? Why, why do we suddenly see this different subtype in the disease? 
Well, uh, again, we did extensive research. We watched a ton of movies um, and then had to re-watch them when we were sober. Um, the uh, one thing we noticed time and time again was that in the new fast zombie subtype, the time between infection and resurrection of zombie became quite short. So we developed what we, know, what we call now the time to resurrection hypothesis. So according to this hypothesis, the time between sudden death due to infection and resurrection, if it's short, as you see in the fast zombie, the amount of time that the brain is starved of oxygen and glucose is relatively short. So what happens when the brain is starved of oxygen and glucose is it starts to die away. It, it induces itself into this hypoxic state, and tissue loss occurs. So if that's relatively short, you don't get as extensive of a tissue loss. But if, as in the older variant, like we saw in Night of the Living Dead, it would take hours, days, weeks, or months in order to resurrect, that's going to lead to much more extensive damage, because the brain is starved of those resources for much longer. The cerebellum and early visual areas are particularly sensitive to hypoxia. So this would predict that we should see a negative correlation between the walking speed of an undead individual and the time at which it took them to resurrect. So this could explain why we get the two different subtypes of the CDHD disorder. All right, so what might cause CDHD? Well, uh, there's, there's lots of potential pathogens that could cause this disorder. Viruses are known to attack the brain. Uh, what you're seeing here is an individual who had a neural infection with the herpes simplex virus. So everything you see here in white is calcified neural tissue. This is the same virus that gives you cold sores in your mouth, except every once in a while, instead of traveling out a cranial nerve, it travels up to the brain. And it can cause extensive damage up in particularly the prefrontal cortex. But most viral damages we know to the brain are very nonspecific and just very global. They wouldn't lead to a very specific pattern of uh, global behavioral deficits. So we don't think viruses are, are what's causing the uh, zombie brain, much to uh, the frustration of the producers of 28 Days Later. Um, bacteria is another potential source of the infection. Uh, this is an image of an individual who had uh, meningitis, which is a bacterial infection. And you see that meningitis ate away uh, basically the lower quarter of this individual's brain. It's a massive infectious disease. Um, and the damage that it does is, again, very nonspecific. So while viruses and bacteria are known to influence the brain, they don't lead to these coordinated, specific regional changes in brain tissue. Uh, another potential candidate is prions. So prions are little forms of protein that, uh, that uh, can unfold the cellular structure of basically all cell types, but particularly neurons. And so this is a brain image of an individual with Creutzfeldt jakobs disease. Everything in white, again, is areas of calcified tissue that have been damaged. Uh, and again, prions are nonspecific. Now, I apologize if you don't sleep tonight, but another potential candidate is Brain worms. Yes, brain worms are real. This is a syndrome known as neurosister sarcosis. And each these arrows are pointing to these little sacs here. Can you guess what's in the little sacs? Yes, a little tapeworm that buries itself in the brain and siphons off nutrients from your blood supply. And this happens from eating uh, fecal contaminated foods. Um, and we actually think it's probably epidemic in third world countries. Um, but normally, these brain worms don't do any harm. They just take up a little bit of space. They siphon off a little bit of resources. But they don't cause big behavioral problems until you have, as I, as I tell you now, one patient had three dozen worms in his head. He started showing behavioral symptoms. But that was because his head basically turned into Swiss cheese. Um, but so we can imagine a case where maybe a subtype of these worms is forming a, a, a chemical interaction with the brain and leading to these slow, specific behavioral changes. Another hypothesis that was put out in the literature is, uh, if you, anybody's seen the movie The Signal, is that TV and radio transmissions can emit a particular EM frequency that causes the neuron activity patterns to change fundamentally. And we know that you can actually kill cells by letting them just fire a lot. So you can see coordinated brain damage, which we sometimes call excitotoxicity, uh, induced by particular stimulus inputs. And this was the, uh, again, this is the uh, premise for the movie The Signal. And at first I thought this was silly until I saw this. So I don't know about you, but that makes me want to kill somebody. So, <laughs> Um, I'm going to go with the Rick Astley theory of the CDHD disorder. 
All right. So, uh, so far I've shown you how you can look at this silly pop culture uh, supernatural entity, this little zombie here, characterize it in a very uh, rigorous way, in a scientific manner, where we can link up specific behavioral traits to the brain and use real science to kind of explain a relatively silly uh, supernatural organism like the zombie. Um, so this really shows the potential of trying to kind of push this, this scientific idea into popular culture in order to educate real scientific principles in the general public. So in a way, what we're trying to do is keep building this bridge between popular culture and science and get these to interplay more in order to facilitate greater scientific education. So if you want to know more, uh, you can obviously read our book, Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? Uh, we also have a set of uh, animated videos released through the TED Ed Foundation. Um, they are great supporters of science outreach. I love the TED Ed Foundation. Um, so we have two videos up about how to diagnose the zombie brain and some fallacies in using neuroimaging to explain brain behavior relationships. Uh, we also have a set of colleagues uh, collective in the Zombie Research Society. This is a bunch of academics who use zombies to teach their particular field. Actually, two members of the Zombie Research Society are here in Boston and Cambridge. Uh, Dan Dresner it teaches uh, uh, the, neuro, uh, sorry, the pol politics and political science of zombies, and he's over at Tufts. Um, and uh, Steve Sloshman is at uh, MGH, and he's a psychiatrist, and he does the psychiatry of zombies. And he actually published a novel on uh, the zombie disorder as a psychiatric condition, which is really fun. Um, so if you're not inter interested in neuroscience but other fields, check out the people who are associated with the Zombie Research Society because they do great work like this. So thank you guys. So questions. Yeah. I have a question about popular uh, zombie movies and TV shows All right. where you see them as truly scientifically inaccurate either in general or in specific important scenes. Uh, actually, I would say 99% of the zombies I've seen in TVs and movies are so unrealistic as to make them impossible. Um, there are a few exceptions. Uh, um, there's a video game, The Last of Us, uh, in which a uh, evolution of the Chordopsis fungus, which actually induces zombieism in uh, ants, really it does, um, somehow mutates and causes the same thing to happen in humans. So you see these zombies running around with giant fungi attached to their heads. Um, and that is, is one that I thought was actually a fairly realistic one, because they're also not undead. You can, you can easily kill them. Um, and then the most realistic representation of zombies that I would say had the biological plausibility were the zombies in the 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later movies. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, the pre premise of the movie is that uh, scientists in Oxford are trying to understand rage and they develop a virus known as the rage virus, which plays with the uh, uh, aggression circuits in the brain and it gets loose on the general public. And what happens is people just be become really just ravenously aggressive. Um, they're not undead. In fact, the premise is that 28 days later means that they're not thinking about eating, so they're going to starve to death in 28 days, and so you can ideally wait out the zombie uh, apocalypse um, just by letting them starve to death. Um, so I thought that probably 28 days later was the most biologically plausible one, but even then, the behavioral patterns and the transmission rates were nowhere near uh, plausible. The scene that frustrated me the most was the last, at the end of The Walking Dead's first season when they were in the CDC and there was this biologically plausible explanation of the neuroscience of zombies. It was so bad that it made me cry. Um, yeah. So speaking of realistic zombies, there's this uh, uh, notion of the, the voodoo zombies and, and being controlled by drugs on mm -hmm. plantations and stuff. I'm just curious. Uh, how that like plays into this. Yeah, so that's actually a, another little side tangent of mine, because the, the zombieism that you see in, in Haitian voodoo culture is um, quite interesting in that it's, it has a proposed neuropharmacological explanation. Um, so there's a, a classic book by Wade Davis, who was an ethnobotanist, who uh, went down to Haiti and uh, made two particular pharmacological links to Haitian zombieism. One was tetrodotoxin, which was the poison used to simulate death. And tetrodotoxin works by blocking the sodium channels that allow neurons to fire in the peripheral nervous system. So your muscles become paralyzed. 
And uh, it actually won't kill you unless your diaphragm stops working. So basically, it kills you because the diaphragm muscle stops working. But if you get a low enough dose, dose what will happen is that your diaphragm will keep moving so slowly that you can't really detect it. But in all intents and purposes, you look dead. Um, so that's the simulated death. And then the control aspects, he proposed that um, the Bakors, who are the kind of the, um, the bad or evil voodoo priests, um, would dose the individual after the tetrodotoxin had worn off when they dug them out of their grave that they were buried alive in, um, would douse them with Dartura, which has three major psychoactive ingredients, hyoscopenes, scopolamine, and atropine, I think. Um, and each one of those will induce a psychotic state. Um, and so the idea is that you can make this person who is now convinced that he's dead because he you know, saw himself dead, he was well aware of everything that was happening to him, felt buried, and then he gets raised, and then there's a psychoactive chemical that keeps him compliant. And that was the Wade Davis theory. It's controversial, it hasn't been replicated yet, and people are, are saying that there's probably other aspects to it that link more to psychological belief. Um, but yeah, the Haitian voodoo zombie kind of links to neurobiology are quite interesting that way. Um, yeah. So, well, I had two questions, but um, so one was what causes zombieism. So in some forms of, of <laughs> movies, um, it's kind of like a venomous thing that if you're bitten, you're infected, right. you get it. In other more recent ones, it's everyone's infected. When you die, you're a zombie. Right. So they're really different outcomes. Right. So I don't know if you had any thoughts about that difference. Yeah. I. I, the we're all infected and we're just going to reanimate when we're you know whenever we kind of Romero. transition from one state. Romero was so we actually we got to interview George Romero and we were asking him about it and he said he the way he made up particularly in his first three movies uh, he didn't care about it he was trying to use the zombies as a metaphor so in the first one he he kept it vague right there was the com the the uh, what was it the satellite from outer space that had come back and it was somehow linked to that but it could have been space radiation but it, and he was saying he explicitly didn't care about what caused it he just wanted them to be there um, in fact he put a, a, a uh, the nail in our coffin of our theory about zombie movement, but I'll tell you about that later. Um, but uh, so, so I think what happened was because the kind of early zombie cultures didn't really care about the mechanism, there was lots of different explanations. Um, from a biological standpoint, it doesn't seem like that would be the case. Now there is one, so I, I like the idea of the infection theory of, of zombieism. So like a latent. Yeah. The, the, the real phenomenon that I think fascinates me the most in this is as, um, toxoplasmosis. So toxoplasmosis is a single cell organism. It's what lives in cat poop. Um, and it's why pregnant women shouldn't be around cat poop is because um, it get, induces flu-like sy symptoms if you get the infection. Um, and it can be dangerous to uh, fetuses and young children. Um, but normally, if you know, you're an adult and you get it, you just get a flu and it seems to go away. But really what happens is it's, it's a single cell organism that re reproduces sexually in the gut of a feline. Right, so that's where it gets its most genetic diversity. When it's outside the feline, it can only rep reproduce asexually, so it clones itself. So what this organism does is even after the infection, it stays latent in your system. And in uh, the mammals that it infects, um, so rodents, humans, it actually starts modifying the neuropharmacology of the individual's brain. And what you see is you see characteristic behavioral differences in people who have had toxoplasmosis and survive versus those who don't. Um, and the, the most classic case of this was an experimental study where they took a rat, and rats normally hate cats. They're instinctively afraid of cats. Gave it a toxoplasmosis uh, intervention. And across time, if you had a glass wall between the rat and the cat, normally the rat's over here. But as the infection rate occurs, the rat actually starts to not only not be afraid, but want to be near the cat. Um, so there's increased risk-taking behavior that happens as a result of the infection. And actually, that same kind of behavior, not towards cats, obviously, but more risk-taking behavior is seen in individu human individuals who've had the infection. So somehow, the single-cell organism is hijacking the complex circuits that induce our, our ability to be afraid of certain things and increase risk-taking. So that 
coupled with the kind of popularization of the infection theory of zombies, I think is the more interesting link there. And if you're going to ask me about biologically plausible, with the caveat that it's still way, way far away, um, that I think is more the route that you would see something like this. So this is more than the rat simply becoming acclimated to having a yeah. rat on another side. Yeah. Of the so you don't see it at all in rats that have never exposed the virus. They stay far away. Um, yeah. Uh, the other question I had pretty quickly. Um, so you talked about the amygdala and rage and anger aggression. Mm -hmm. um, so I also have heard of Kluver Busey syndrome, which is basically mm -hmm. uncontrolled appetite. Yeah, yeah. You didn't talk much about the why the appetite side rage can be all sorts of aggressive behavior. Yeah, so Kluver Busey syndrome is a rare uh, neurological disorder that happens. It can only occur when you get both the amygdala damage, um, and they ex exhibit hyperorality, hypersexuality. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very odd characteristic feature. So you caught a hole in our theory because according to our theory, zombies should be hyperoral, hypersexual. They should also be hyperfearful because the amygdala actually controls fight and flight. So what it's doing is if you leave it unattacked, zombies should be just as easily spooked as pissed off. So uh, they, you did catch the hole in the theory. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, so there was this uh, CDC blog post a while ago about what to do in the event of a zombie outbreak. Uh, how, you know, do you have any critiques of that? Did they I do a good job? I loved that. I thought right. they did a great job. Because really what they were doing is epidemic preparedness and emergency preparedness, but just couched in zombies. I mean, it got people's attention. It got people excited about doing it. Instead of just doing, okay, we're going to pretend that there's a SARS virus out, people, you know, kind of habituate to these things. But if you do it tongue in cheek, people got engaged and it got a lot of, I think, I think it got a lot more people interested in thinking about preparedness for epidemics and emergencies than if they had just done anything else, except for maybe now they could probably do it with Ebola. Um, um, but otherwise, yeah, I thought it was a great idea. And I like seeing agencies kind of do that tongue in cheekness to kind of engage awareness and attention. Did you still have your question? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, first of all, thank you. Super helpful. I added more cardio into my <laughs> life after I watched Zombieland, so I'm okay. more prepared. Uh, the second was, do you and your friends at the Zombie Research Society plan on doing research into other parts of the zombie body, so beyond the brain? Yeah, so the, the one, so we did a uh, Reddit AMA, uh, and one of the questions was about like the gut system, and um, I think, uh, the next avenue of zombie science is zombie internal medicine, because how do zombies get their nutrients when you've got your entrails dragging on the ground? Um, I think that's a fascinating question. Um, so I think that, that, that you know, getting people interested in talking about digestive systems and poop is normally not that interesting, but you couch it in zombies, it can be interesting. Um, same with, I think, uh, you know, cardiac systems and blood systems from a biological angle. I think there's lots on the biological side that you can explore in the zombie body um, because you know their physiology. How do you explain how you could have somebody that's you know, got thick, goop, viscous blood but somehow still manages to be animated? Um, so yeah, I think that would be a fun avenue on the biological side. And of course, on the social side, you can use zombies to explain anything, right? Uh, different hierarchical societies, um, you, I, Zombie cognitive phenomenon, I think, would be really interesting. So there's, I, I don't really think there's anything you can't do with zombies just because they keep changing. They're not like vampires and werewolves, which have a very static you know, structure. Zombies keep changing with time. So you can always find an example of a zombie doing something that you want to you know, study. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the zombie internal medicine. So uh, one connection that you didn't touch on is uh, between rabies and zombie. I've heard right. people talk about that. Any comments on whether rabies would be or a form of rabies would be? A, uh, yeah, so the, the longer version of the talk, we actually go over this because um, uh, when we go over the memory systems and the impulse control systems, uh, those are all linked up to an, uh, a system known as the PAPE circuit. That's a classic neurological circuit that was discovered uh, in the 1930s. And it was discovered using the rabies virus. Um, and so what this guy, James Papes, would do is he was trying to find the link between emotion and intention. How is it that uh, we can't remember what we did at the store yesterday, but everybody remembers where they were at 9-11? Like, how do we have these emotional bondings of, their, of memories? 
Um, and so he mapped out this theoretical circuit and then would map it out in cats by injecting the rabies virus and watching the virus propagate from one area to the next, look for the connections. And he actually made cats that were uh, that had memory problems, they were hyper aggressive. Um, so we do a tongue in cheek sing thing saying that uh, uh, James Papes made the first zombie cats. Um, but the rabies virus is a very specific type of infection and it's non, it's very general. So what it does is it kind of attacks a particular cell, jumps across what's known as the synapse, which is the kind of gap between cells, and keeps propagating down to the next cell and it just wanders. It just kind of follows from place to place. So if you get an infection in one part of the brain, it's where it goes is determined by who it's connected with. And it'll keep traveling until it basically kills the organism. Um, now, normally you get some symptoms like the um, cognitive disorders. You'll get you know, delusions and dementia with rabies infection. Um, you get um, hydrophobia. Um, so uh, individuals infected with the rabies virus will be afraid of water. They won't drink. They'll become dehydrated. Um, and some of those are explained by um, uh, the virus doesn't survive well when there's lots of brain swelling, so they're trying to de it, it automatically dehydrates you to keep that brain swelling down. Um, things like that have been put forth as explanations for those kind of behaviors. But I think a lot of them just have to be, people show those when the virus has spread so far throughout the brain as to basically wipe away most of the neocortex. And so um, it's nonspecific in the sense of where it's attacking, but we really start to see the symptoms once it's just so widespread as to be catastrophic. Um, so yeah, the rabies virus is, 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 has been linked to zombies more times than I, I think anything else. So like the book World War Z, the first name for the virus was uh, African rabies because they first talked about it in South Africa. Um, and there's been a lot of movies that talk tongue in cheek about you know, a rabies-like infection. Um, so that, I, th I think that's just because more of the kind of hyper aggressive impulsive responses. Um, but we don't really see how that's occurring yet until you get to this catastrophic stage. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So that's a, it's a good kind of infectious disease that way, uh, to use as a metaphor. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thank you guys very much. Thanks for inviting me out. Happy Halloween.